Well, good morning, family. Good morning. Come on, how's everybody doing this morning? Good? Oh, come on. Is everybody doing good this morning? After baptism, you ought to have to praise in your belly. Are you doing good this morning? Wow, what a powerful day. I, I, it's just, to me, it is so life-giving to see life change. Come on. It is life-giving to see life change. And I believe that God is going to change us even now, even today. Before we get started, though, I want to I give you a quick announcement. School enrollment. Okay, we've had some grades, I think, that have already maxed. Okay, you need to get your kids in the school. We have a K-12 through school right here on campus, and maybe many of you might be new today. Uh, we're going to have representatives from our school. Our head of school is here. Dr. Aaron Gonzalez is in the front row. Can we honor him this morning? <laughs> He's doing a wonderful job over there. He will be happy to talk with you on the opportunity to put your kids in the school. In the state of Florida, we have the Step Up Scholarship. It's an opportunity where kids can literally choose basically what school they go to. So why not choose a school that is teaching the gospel? Amen, church. So stop by the, by the table for just 60 seconds and just get some information. It's not a blood contract, okay? Just get some information, and uh, then you'll be able to make a decision after that. Also, I know there are other tables in the lobby. I know our students are going to camp in just a couple weeks. So if some of you want to sponsor our students going to camp in Kentucky. That would be awesome. I hear there's a foreign exchange student table in the lobby. So if God is speaking to your heart about hosting and doing certain things like that, you could stop by that as well. Plenty of, of ministry going on at this church for you to be a part of. Pastor Rick is out today. Pastor Rick has been blessed to use his gift all over the state and the country and the globe. Can we honor Pastor Rick and Pastor Becky right now <laughs> corporately? We love you guys so much. And I'm so excited to be a part of what God is doing in his life and what God is doing at this church. Okay, without further ado, the formalities are out of the way. It is now time for the word. Amen, church. If you're ready for the word, shout yes. Here we go. Church ought to be the most exciting thing. You ought to be so excited just be here. Like, man, we don't even know what's going to, you don't want, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what I'm going to say. It could be a bunch of nonsense, but at least let's hope it's good nonsense. Amen, church. Here we go. Let's start part one of the series called parables. All right. And we'll start with the lamp. So in this series, we will learn from the greatest teacher of all time, Jesus. Jesus had a way of relating to people in a practical way. One of the ways he conveyed ideas was through parables. Today we will take a look at one of those parables and learn as Jesus taught. So let's start by defining what a parable is. Parable. Here's the Oxford Dictionary definition. Are you ready? A simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. In other words, a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So maybe many of you have not even heard the, the term parable and wondering what that is. Well, basically it is exactly what we said, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Because sometimes the easiest thing to comprehend is the thing that is simplest to understand, okay? So sometimes we need to simplify it for us to be able to understand it. And parables serve that exact purpose. Oftentimes, it's easier for us as people to relate to stories that we can identify with. So maybe God is trying to convey a spiritual message or a spiritual idea. And what he does is he uses something that we, me and you, can relate to in order to understand that idea. So today we're going to be talking about the parable of the lamp. Let's take off reading Mark 4, 21 through 25. It says this, then Jesus asked them a crazy question. Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open. And every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. A lot of ears in this room today. Then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. 
The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given. And you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. I mean, we could close right there. <laughs> we could close right there. It's a wonderful story. Let's take a look at a few points we can understand from that story. Here we go. When I read the story, I think of point number one. Know your purpose. All right? Guys, this don't have to be too deep, all right? Because a lamp, he starts the story talking about a lamp. And what is a lamp supposed to do? He says, who would take a lamp and, and put it under the bed? Why? Because it lights nothing under the bed. So it makes no sense because the lamp's purpose is not to exist under the bed. Its purpose is to exist out in the open so people can see light. Amen. So a lamp is not supposed to be hidden. It's supposed to be out in the open. And so I believe God is speaking to purpose there. You have to know your purpose. And you are probably a lot like me. It's you're wondering, what is my ultimate purpose on this earth? You're trying to figure out, what has God placed me on this earth to do? Because it's got to mean more than this. Anybody ever said this in your life? There's got to be more to life than this. This cannot be it. So you're trying to figure out, man, God, what is my purpose in this earth? What is the reason why you have set me here? I would love to know how I fit in the grand scheme and the grand idea. And I prayed those exact same prayers. But let me tell you something, church. We stress ourselves too much thinking about specific purpose when the Bible gives us what our purpose is on the earth in a generalized way. Because there are two different types of purpose. There's a general purpose and a specific pur purpose. Most of our life, we're stressed about specific purposes. Today, you're going to learn that you have a general purpose. Look what scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and 33. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I, too, try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what it, look, listen to this. I don't just do what is best for me. I don't just do what is best for me. So while you're trying to win every argument with your friends, that's why you have no friends. Because you argue with them. Your family. I don't just do what is best for me. If I did what was best for me, I'd be saying all kind of things to you. I don't just do what is best for me. Paul's right here if we could just get this this would be a much better world I don't just do what's best for me so maybe some of these thoughts that I have and I say something that's hurtful maybe I should stop before I say it because I don't just do what's best for me oh but it's gonna make me feel better if I say this no it's not <laughs> oh but I just gotta say it why why why? I come to give you some freedom. The universe don't revolve around you. Hey, let me help you. Some of us don't care. I'm going to help you out this morning. You think we're all thinking about you? I got my own stuff to think about. I don't do what's just best for me. Look what the Bible says. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. Yeah. So the next time you think you gotta say something, the next time you think you gotta slap somebody, the next time you think you gotta get in a fist fight, I don't just do what is best for me. But what if my son said, I don't just do what is best for me. You say, oh, I'm tired. I don't know why am I going to church. I don't listen. I'm finna, I'm finna go deep. This wasn't in the first two services. Here we go. You wonder why you come to church, you join online. Do you think you're doing that just for you? 
that's why we each get up in the morning and all of us had an excuse not to come. I'm trying to be real with you. Unless some of y'all are angels in the flesh. We all got up and we thought to ourselves, am I a little bit sick? <laughs> am I just a little sick? <laughs> so then I can call him, I can tell him, hey, I was sick. <laughs> Why weren't you at church? I was sick. We all had an excuse not to come. We don't just come for ourselves. If we do it for ourselves, we'd never do nothing right. We don't just do it for ourselves. You understand part of the reason you come to church is serving your purpose so that you can be a good Christian. Because when you are saved, you realize it's no longer your life to live. I know this teaching is not popular, but it needs to happen. It is no longer your life to live. What did the Bible say? It says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. So I gave up wanting to be sick <laughs> when I decided to follow Jesus. Because I understood that meant a certain level of sacrifice. And anything worth having is worth sacrificing for. The faith that you have, the life you have with Jesus is worth having. So in turn, it's worth sacrificing for. So you get up and you're not sick. You get up and you're well. And you get up and you're excited to come to church. Not only because God is going to make you better, but you want to learn your purpose. And it's going to encourage you that wherever you go this week, that you're going to do everything in your power to live for the glory of God. Amen, church. I don't just do this for me. So know your purpose. Know your purpose so that other people can be saved. You got to live your life for the glory of God. That's our divine purpose on earth. No matter where you work, some of you are asking, Lord, is this the end job you have for me? Guess what? He'll give you the answer in time. But while you are where you are, you need to represent God well, okay? Hold on, hold on, hold on, church, hold on. While you are where you I know you don't like your job. I know you don't like your job. That's not a good reason to act out. Because you're representing God where you are. So while you think that your purpose is somehow earthly, your purpose is eternal. So even when you don't like where you work, understand I don't work for you. <laughs> I don't work for you. You might be the one on a check, but I don't work for you. I live my life for the glory of God. So no matter how you choose to treat me, I am going to carry myself in a certain way. My purpose on this earth is to live and give God glory. So you need to be encouraged that you don't like your job. You're right where you need to be. God will give you a new job when it's time. He'll open the door when it's time. Do you think he's going to open a door if you're not acting right in the current room you're in? You got to be faithful over a few things and God will make you a ruler over many. If you're wondering why that door hasn't opened to the next job, you need to check how you're acting in the current one you in. I don't even know where this came from. Back to purpose. One of our purposes in life is just to be a great example to others. It's very simple. It's important in life to be a good Christian and to have the heart of God. I said be a good Christian and have the heart of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Honoring God and all we do fulfills purpose in our lives. I heard a story once about a priest and this priest was in the jungle and the first thing I ask is, priest, what are you doing in the jungle? <laughs> but nonetheless, he's in the jungle. And he comes up on two lions. And 
He thinks to himself, this is it for me. This is my last moment. But as a last effort, he said, I'm going to pray because that's what we all do when we get in trouble. We pray. So he says to himself, I got to pray. So what he does is, is he says, Lord God, if you will please let these two lions have the heart of a Christian. Lord, please let these lions honor you in this moment. Let them be a good Christian and give them your heart, God. Amen. And so the priest prays the prayer and he's like, I know that was a good prayer. Now you and I are thinking, why wouldn't he just pray, Lord, just save me. I don't care how you do it, just save me. But nonetheless, he prayed, let them have a heart of a Christian because, you know, we're not going to murder, you're going to let me live, we're going to have, you know, grace on each other, that kind of thing. And so uh, the story goes, there was a light that came from heaven through the trees in the jungle. And he said it shined on the lions and the lions reared up and they got back on their two feet. They stood up real tall. And the man was looking and he thought, okay, God didn't hear me. He thought, this is it for me. And the lions, they got up and they put their hands together like this. And the priest was thinking, what is going on here? And he said he started hearing the lions talk English. And we were like, what is going on? And he said that the lions said, put their hands, their paws together like this. And the lion said, dear Lord God, thank you for this delicious meal we're about to eat. We honor you. Amen. <laughs> and the lions had a feast <laughs> on the priest. <laughs> but it's important to honor God in all that we do. Pastor Rick talks all the time about praying over the meal at the restaurant. We're not doing that for show. We're doing that so that maybe there's somebody else in the restaurant. Now, look, my heart is to thank God for the food, but I also think maybe there's someone else in here that has been looking for Jesus, has been searching for Jesus. And just the fact that I took the time to thank God for what he has given, for what he has presented, maybe it will encourage someone else to walk boldly in their faith. So honor God in all you do. Why? Number two, let your light shine. Simple. He said, would anybody take a lamp and put it under a bed? No. Let your light shine. Some of you who are old school, you guys know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. What happened to the shine? <laughs> this little light. I gotta let my light shine. I heard someone ask, what's more important? The sun or the moon? And one guy said, it is obviously the sun. And everyone agreed. But there was one dumb guy in the room, and he said, no, it's obviously the moon. And everyone looked around, and they were confused. And they asked the guy, they said, why? Why do you think it's the moon? And the guy said, the moon gives us light in the darkness, while the sun only shines when it's already bright outside. <laughs> Come on, bruh. The sun is the reason it's bright outside, brother. And it's a powerful sun in this state of Florida. I'm telling you what. But look, it's the sun who lights the moon. It's the sun who lights the moon. And then we can see at night. Watch what the Bible says. You ain't going to never forget this. Look at this. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. So watch this. The sun shines and then the moon is a reflection of the sun. 
What am I saying? When you allow your light to shine, it will light up others. And though you might not be able to shine in their darkness, the light in you will encourage them to shine. Sometimes just being an example is more than enough. Sometimes it's not about putting your hands to it and controlling everybody. Sometimes it's just about being a good example. And maybe we'll, people will see you and be encouraged to shine in their own situation. Say man, church. Amen. Number three, don't let others dim your light. Amen. This is an important one because we found ourselves here in society. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 9. It says, for God who said... Let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair spare we are hunted down but never abandoned by God we get knocked down but we are not destroyed amen church don't let others dim your light the scripture is telling us look we've been pressed on every side we've been hit on every side we've got circumstances and trials that have come against us and what the enemy would love to see happen is that your light become dim or your light goes off altogether He would love that. He would love if he could press you so hard with circumstances that you would just decide that your light is off. That's the thing of the enemy. The enemy is tricky, right? He wants to turn your light off. And this is the thing about the enemy. The enemy is a liar. He is the father of lies. And matter of fact, he cannot tell the truth. So this is what the enemy does, what he will do. He doesn't come at you and say, oh, you're going to die. You're nothing. God doesn't have a plan for you. not saying all of that because we know he's a liar. But what he does do is make you question yourself. If he can approach you with a, if he approached you with a statement, you would recognize it immediately. But he approaches you with a, a, a question. Why would God use you? See, some of you are who are believers. If he approached you today and said, God will not use you, you would know it's a lie because the enemy is the father of lies and he cannot tell you the truth. But what happens is he gets us to question ourselves. Why would God use you? After all that you've been through, do you really think you're worthy? When we begin to question ourselves, is when we allow our light to become dim. Because let me tell you something, God is not questioning you. God's not questioning who you are. Why do I know that? Because your identity is found in him alone. So he sees you as you are. He doesn't see a lie. He does not see the circumstances you're in. He sees you as you're designed to be. Why? Because he looks through a filter called the blood of Jesus. And when he looks through that filter, he sees you as complete. He sees you as whole. So God is not trying to get you. He's not trying to take you out. He wants you to walk in purpose. It is the enemy that wants your light to be dim. Let your light shine. Number four. Once you let your light shine, number four, the light in you is more than enough. So don't think today that you don't measure up, that you're not worth it, that somehow there's something wrong with you that's going to cause you to not be able to walk in the promises God has for you let me tell you he's already equipped you with everything you need look at what john 8 and 12 says jesus spoke to the people once more and said i am the light of the world if you follow me you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life jesus is the light of the world church somebody said to me they said 
The world is worse than what it's ever been. I said, maybe. <laughs> but that's exciting for me. And I'm like, why are you excited? Do you see all this persecution? Do you see all this craziness going on even in America? America. <laughs> They're shocked. I can't believe this is happening in America. I said, this is great. It's getting darker. Great. They're like, what's wrong with you? The darker it is, the more need for the light. This is an opportunity. The worse I see it getting, I say, thank you, God, that revival is coming because the darkness produces a need for people to see light. This is an opportunity for us to be a light in the world. Why are we shocked that the world is the world? Why are we shocked? Can say, I, 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 I don't know. Why are we shocked? <laughs> when the world is acting like the world, I'm not shocked. When the world acts like the world, the church acts like the church. And they're supposed to be separate. <laughs> I'm going to help you, church, because some of you watch the news and you go to bed and you think Jesus is coming tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to help you. Now, he can come anytime he wants, but I'm going to help you so you sleep easy tonight. This is the greatest opportunity of ministry we've ever seen in the history of mankind. This is an opportunity for Jesus. So you ought to start thinking when you wake up, I don't want to go deal with these people, man. Stop thinking that. Think of it as an opportunity for you to be a light in the darkness. Think of it as an opportunity to show Jesus to be a good example. Remember, we don't do this for ourselves. We do this so that others would be saved. So wake up knowing that it's an opportunity to be a light. I want to read this story to you to end. I know that seems so short, but we're ending now. I want to read Acts chapter 3, 1 through 8. One day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John were on their way into the temple for a prayer meeting. At the same time, there was a man crippled from birth being carried up. Every day he was set down at the temple gate the one named beautiful, to beg from those going into the temple. Now, look at this. There's, I want to explain to you. There's a man here who's been crippled. He has an ailment. He's been crippled for um, pretty much all his life. And now he has decided that this is all it's going to be. That's his identity. It's the crippled beggar. That's what everyone knows him as, is the crippled beggar, the guy who begs. He stands at the temple where he's not supposed to be, and he begs people for money. And I think, church, if we're not careful, we can become comfortable in our dysfunction. We can begin to identify with our dysfunction. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you an example. Some, you heard some people say, I just have a short fuse. You heard some people say that. Some of y'all didn't say amen because you say it. I have a short fuse. You have no discipline. That's what you meant to say. Well, I'm just, I'm, I just get angry quick. You're immature. That's what you meant to say. Oh, well, I just say it like it is. I just tell it like it is. You have no discipline. You can't tame your tongue. That's what you meant to say. Oh, well, this is just how God made me. No, that's how you made you. That's not how God made you. That's how you made you. If we're not careful, we can identify with being dysfunctional. And we can start claiming that is our identity. I'm not doing that. Why would I get out? I tell the young adults all the time. Some of them are in here. They remember I see some here and there. They remember I say, why do you take pride in being called a savage? Why do you take pride in everyone knowing you as the angry person? What has caused you to take pride in that? Do you get up in the mirror and say, today is the day anybody says something to me, I'm popping off immediately. <laughs> why do you take pride in that? That's not something to celebrate. 
when did we start when did we start celebrating dysfunctional activities dysfunctional behavior how did we start celebrating that when they know they're gonna get the truth from me when they ask me i'm gonna tell them you premeditating it <laughs> they not let me tell you something they not even gonna ask you you ready for them to ask you they not even gonna ask when did we start celebrating oh that's just who i am are you serious that don't sound like light to me that sound like darkness when did we get up and decide that we would identify with being dysfunctional before i got here i had to say god i'm sorry because I was being who I wanted to be, not who you wanted me to be. And sometimes that's going to require some self-reflection. You're going to have to go to the mirror and first be willing to admit, maybe I don't got it all together. Have you ever, before you had a conversation with someone, you're just going to argue, have you ever stopped and said, Maybe I'm wrong. Have you ever done that? Where you done convinced yourself all night long you're right. You done got up, you done searched it on Google, you done got articles, you done took a, you done took a screenshot of it, you're like, as soon as they say this, I'm finna. What if I'm wrong? What if? Maybe I need to quit walking with my head so high and remember to get down on my knees and make sure that I remain humble before the Lord so that when I speak to someone, it won't be me talking. That when I speak, it'll be God talking through me because it ain't about me anyway. So please stop identifying with dysfunction because it can go on for 40, 50, 60 years and you'll miss the fact that God wanted to work that in you. Let's keep reading. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for a handout. Peter, with John at his side, looked him straight in the eye and said, look here. He looked up, expecting to get something from them. Peter said, I don't have a nickel to my name. <laughs> Come on, somebody identify with that. <laughs> I don't got a nickel to my name. But what I do have, I do have the light. I give you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, put yourself in Peter's shoes, okay? So look at this. Peter, they come up on this man. Now, this is after they've received the Holy Ghost. They come up on this man, and, and he's asking them for money. And Peter said, look at us. We broke. <laughs> we broke. We don't got no money. Look, do you see us? <laughs> That's how, listen, look, read the scripture. They said, do you not see us? Something tells me they was looking tattered. <laughs> do you see our clothes? We're not wearing no shoes. <laughs> look at us. I don't got a nickel to my name. But what I do have, I do have the lights. In the name of Jesus, you get up and walk right now. And guess what, church? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. We're going to read the scripture. You're going to see. He said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And nothing happened. Nothing. Nothing happened. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you prayed to God? Said, God, please give me this or that. And when he doesn't answer your prayer, can you still be a light? Yeah. Yeah. If he doesn't give you everything you want instantaneously, can you still be a light? Yeah. 
Look what the scripture said. Nothing happened. How do I know nothing happened? Because the scripture said, verse 7, Peter had to grab him. Okay, so there was a pause here where he said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Nothing happened. And if it's like me and you, we would give up on God immediately. We expected him to just jump straight up as soon as I said, in the name of Jesus. See, that's the problem with you and I is we want the light without the work. We want to be the light. I want you to do a miraculous work uh, through me, God, when God is saying, I want to do a miraculous work in you. I want to work in you before I work through you. So if he's like me and you, we would see the man not get up and just think, that's it. That's it. No healing. But what does Peter do? He's not afraid of the work. He reaches out. And look what the Bible said. Let's read verse 7. He grabbed him by the right hand. What did he have to do? And pulled him up. Then look what the scripture said. In an instant after he pulled him up. Then in an instant his feet and ankles became firm. He jumped to his feet and walked. The man went into the temple with them. Walking back and forth. Dancing and praising God. Everybody there saw him walking around and praising God. They recognized him as the one who sat begging at the temple gate beautiful and rubbed their eyes astonished scarcely believing what they were seeing don't tell me what God can't do when you get out of the way if we will allow God to shine in our lives but it doesn't always happen in an instant the light requires work Just because it doesn't work immediately doesn't mean it's not ever going to work. Some of you said, I've been working on my sons and daughters for five years. Nothing's happened. Work six years and then seven and keep going. Why do you quit when it doesn't happen instantly? I've been working on my marriage for this long. I, I, it's, it's over. How long you been working? Well, it's been about two years. Go ahead and go three, four. The light requires work. Now, I know that's not popular because we want everything instantaneous. Look, think about these lights in here. Look at this. The lights are on. We take that for granted. But they've got a fader up there that causes the lights to go on and off. Can y'all hit that fader? Yeah, look at that. You see how the lights just went off? Now let's turn them back on. And it came on instantly. And that's unfortunately how we want life to work. But y'all want to know the truth? What's more important than the light and what you don't know are the many hours it took to run the wire to the light so that it would even turn on. In a house, you walk in your house. Think about your house now. You walk in at night, what's the first thing you do? Turn on the light, and the light pops on. And it's beautiful because we can see. But what we can't see are the many hours it took to lay the electrical to wire up the house, to run it to a panel, to turn on that breaker, install the light fixture, and then you and I get to use it. The light requires work. I know today, you wanna be a light. I want to be like Peter and John. I want to let God do miracles in my life. I've, I, I want to be a light. How do I do that? It requires work. It's not instant. That's why we're here. Sometimes it requires you to make a sacrifice. It requires you to look at yourself and say, God, maybe... You would like to do a new thing in my life, and I'm open to it. Oh, well, I'm, 
but I'm already, I, I got the business I like, I got the car, I got the house that I like. Everything is exactly how I like, but is it exactly how he likes? And it requires you sometimes to be open. I'm closing now. Today, what if God wanted to do a new thing in your life? Would you be open to it? If God wanted to change everything you've ever known, everything you've ever learned, everything you've known about yourself, everything you thought you knew about yourself, everything you thought you knew about your future, what if God wanted to change that today? Would you be open to God doing a new thing in your life? The light requires work. Listen, church, there is no light without Jesus. And in order for Jesus to live on the inside of you, you've got to be willing to accept it. So what, will the miracles happen? Yes, after you are the light. So many of you today have a choice. You have a choice to be a light. But understand, before you can shine, God wants to do a work in you. He's not done with you, church. If he's not done with you, why are you done with you? If he's not done with you, why are you done with you? It doesn't have to be everybody, but those who are open just right where you are, can you just lift your hands up right where you are? If you're open to God doing a new thing, it don't got to be everyone. It's okay. You just... Lord, do a new thing in our lives. We receive the new work that you want to do. Lord, we've not arrived. We've not got it all together. And even this morning, we repent for even acting as such as though we did have it all together. But our arms are up saying, Lord, we're open to you doing a new thing. Whatever it is. We're open to you doing a new work in us. We want to shine bright. We want the world to be saved, but we understand it starts inside of us, not around us. So, Lord, do a work, and I know it's been hard. I feel the trauma that you're feeling. I understand how much has happened to you, but don't allow your light to go off. Don't allow your light to become dim. I know it's been a struggle. I know it's been a lot that's going on that's called shame to come to your life. But don't allow the light to become dim because Jesus is more than enough. And our arms are open saying, Lord, do a new thing in our life. In Jesus' name, if you receive it, say amen. amen. Let's keep praying. Father, I thank you this morning for the work that you're doing. You're causing us to know our purpose. Lord, we're so thankful for that. You're helping us to let our light shine and we're so grateful. But Lord, we need your help to stay lit, to stay on fire and not allow others to dim our light. And we understand, Lord, that when we can stay on fire for you, that your light, you are the light and you are more than enough maybe you're in here this morning and you've never accepted jesus as your lord and savior can i tell you it is the best decision you will ever make it causes you to shine bright and not only that god has prepared a place for you in eternity called heaven where we get to dwell with him forever and that spot is reserved for you but only 
when you accept him into your life as your Lord and Savior. If you've never accepted Jesus, I would love to pray with you. Maybe you're in here and you're part of a different group of people that's accepted Jesus before. You believe he's the son of God. You believe he died for you and that he rose again. You believe all those things. But right now, your heart is convicted and you know today is the moment where you become open to God doing a new thing. Oh, you know you've become separated from God. You've become closed off. But maybe today you want to start fresh with God. You want to start over. We call that rededicating your life to Christ. I would love to pray with you. Oh, this is the day to shine, church. This is the day to shine. If you're in either one of those two categories, if you never accepted Jesus, or you'd like to rededicate your life to Jesus, can you just boldly throw your hand up right now? Just boldly put your hand up. Yes, 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 yes. Come on. I see those hands up top. Just going left to right. Yes, 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 yes. I see those hands. Come on. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, come on, come on. Yes, yes. Anybody? Yes, yes. Anybody else? Yes, yes. Come on, today's the day of redemption. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Yes, come on. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. I'm worried about what God thinks. Yes, yes. Anybody else? Oh, come on. We're going to shine today. In a moment, I'm going to lead a prayer. And I believe that if you say this prayer and believe it with all your heart, today is the day you receive salvation. So will everyone repeat after me, but especially those who raised your hand? Will you say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again and you're alive right now. So please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. Help me to be the person you want me to be and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Come on, can we give it up for Jesus? Come on, come on, come on. Right now, come on, come on, come on. You were just guided through the salvation prayer. If you gave your heart to Jesus today, you have just made the best decision ever. You may be wondering, what's next? Well, we have you covered. Scan the code on the screen to learn how you can grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you would like to connect with someone personally, you can text FCC guests to 97,000 to connect with our team. Now is the time in our service when we prepare to give our tithes and offerings. If this is your first time tuning in with us, please feel no obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. If you call FCC or church and you want to participate in giving today, you can text FCC Give to 97000 or you can give securely online at FCCLive.com slash give. I'm going to take this time to pray over our offering. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this day and thank you for this opportunity to give. I pray that you use it and build your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you'd like prayer today, you can text FCC Prayer to 97000 and a member of our prayer team will reach out to you. Thanks for joining us for church today. We hope you have the best week ever.